Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shona Smith along with Diane King Hall. Let's get you up to speed on the market action here as we start the final hour of the trading day. All three of the major averages heading lower here in the final hour. You have the Dow up 189 points, NASDAQ off just about a tenth of a percent. The S&P back below 4,400. Stocks really taking a breather here to start the week, pulling back from the highest levels that we've seen in just over a year last week. Worst performers here of the day so far, energy, materials, and real estate. Well, the market's looking ahead to Fed Chair Jerome Powell's two days of congressional testimony starting tomorrow. Now, investors will be looking for any clues on the future direction of rates here after the central bank left rates unchanged at its meeting last week. For more on this, we want to bring in Jeremy Bryan, Gradient Investments Senior Portfolio Manager. Jeremy, it's great to see you here. So we heard Fed, we heard the Fed, we heard Fed Chair Jerome Powell signal that two more rates are likely on the table before the end of the year. The market, though, is still only pricing in one more rate hike. What do you think is on the table? Why do you think the market still continues to really discount or only hear what it wants to hear when it comes to the Fed's message? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it really is because the I, I think the pause has a little bit to do with that, right? Is that if you're that certain about that you're going to make two more moves, why not just make one right now? Right. And so I think they are they're still talking about because they need to set the expectation that, hey, we could go higher later on. They need to set that expectation through their commentary. And I expect that to happen again in the coming weeks uh, going forward here. But from our perspective, too, the things that they're doing are working. Leading into economic indicators are coming down, which means we're slowing. Inflation is coming down. Core is a little stickier. But that also has some measurements that'll that'll continue to come down as we go forward. So I think from my perspective, that's what the market is seeing is why get super aggressive when you don't need to. And the fact that we just had a pause is kind of relaying that same thesis and in, in, in case for them. Speaking of your perspective, Jeremy, we want to hear your perspective on what your base case is now going forward. Are you expecting another one, given that we just had a pause, another hike? I think we're in pause mode. Uh, I, I really do. If we get one more, I wouldn't be surprised. Two more would be a surprise to me. Uh, and I think the market, as you all said before, was I think the market would be surprised by that as well. And so, you know, again, from my perspective, if we're talking about pausing in June, why are we going to do two more down the road? I, I, I just that was a disconnect that I really didn't understand that well, that if you're convinced that you have to do two more, you probably just keep going on that pace. I think from my perspective, I we could definitely see one more. That's not going to tip things over. I think if we got to two and they were still talking after one that they had one or even two more to go, I think the market then starts to take a pause and it's like, oh, we, we may have to take them at their word. Jeremy, what do you think this means for the economy, for the odds that we will see a soft landing? Is that then you think more likely to materialize given the fact that the economy up until this point has remained very resilient? Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, a lot of it's going to depend on jobs, to be completely honest with you, is that's the one thing that's held up, right, is that jobs and, and even wage growth has held up relatively well. It's still under inflation, but the fact that we haven't lost a lot of jobs and our wages are growing near at the level of core inflation now leads to a resilient consumer, right? You're seeing it in housing data where they're still buying, even though mortgages are higher, and they're still buying other things. Now, they've shifted from one thing to another during this time, but overall, they're still buying. And so that's where the resiliency is lied. And that's where if that really starts to turn over aggressively and getting to four, even four and a half percent isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a much worse increase in the unemployment rate of that recessionary type of like six, seven, eight percent. If we start to see that and they start to see your neighbors losing their jobs, to be completely honest with you, that's what curtails spending. And then from that perspective, that's where the difficulties would really lie. So, Jeremy, of course, we know this is a data dependent Fed as they've continued to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. Uh, and the job market, as you mentioned, has held up. Uh, but inflation has been sticky, uh, giving, you know, uh, giving some difficulty to consumers, but not enough to really stop consumers in their tracks. Your, are, are your expectations for consumer strength to hold up through the back half of this year? It'll moderate. It'll moderate, but it won't fall off a cliff. You know, again, a lot of it's going to depend on if we start to see really significant layoffs, right? Is that the job market trends have still been relative, even though slowing, still relatively strong overall. So 
from our perspective, that would be the biggest shift and change to where we would have to change what we think from an economic course perspective that we're looking at, and certainly from a market perspective and what we're looking at, is the consumer has been driving this economy here for a while. They need to, while they, you know, we don't necessarily need them to accelerate, but they can't stop either. And so from that perspective, that's what we're paying a ton of attention to, to understand what the future looks like is going to be driven by jobs and the consumer. Let's talk a little bit more about the future, Jeremy, because Morgan Stanley was out with the note today warning that investors may be in for a, quote, rude awakening when it comes to earnings. They talked about the fact that the fading fiscal support, also lower liquidity, that that's expected to weigh on quarterly results in the second half of the year. When it comes to earnings, what are you expecting to see over the next two quarters? Yeah. Uh, certainly not the level of, you know, I would call their estimates a bit draconian. Could absolutely happen, sure, but I, it's not, certainly not our base case. You know, our base case is for an area of kind of stabilization is what I would call it, is we've heard enough from the companies now to saying, hey, our customers are still doing what they've intended to do. Our growth profile looks like, you know, what they're talking about the most is how many days a week they can get their employees back in the office, right? They're not talking about a massive slowdown in demand or end consumers or these kinds of things to where we don't see that big trajectory downward. So we think year over year, that's kind of how we think about things. We think year over year for 2023 is about right at this flattish to maybe slight Slight increase to slight decline, right? I think 3% either way. But the more important component to us is as we go into the fall months, what is 2024 estimates doing? What are they changing? Because right now we're anticipating 11, 12% growth. And if we're anywhere near that, that's a good catalyst for the markets to kind of continue to propel higher is on a re-accelerating growth story, especially outside of those main industries that have, that have been benefiting so far. Where are you expecting to see the growth? I know you talk about the main industry, so we often talk about the Magnificent Seven, the tech sector, this AI growth that we're seeing. Where else are you expecting to see growth in terms of earnings? I think healthcare is interesting. Um, you know, it tends to be, it, it, it tends, you know, it looks like they're having a decline in earnings this year that is supposed to reaccelerate next year. I think those are companies that are actually really interesting from a perspective of stabilized growth that could reaccelerate a little bit as procedures come back more into the forefront. We heard actually United Healthcare talk about costs for rising a little bit. Obviously, that's negative for the insurers, but good for device companies and for people who do elective procedures. So I think those are areas where we could see some accelerated growth, both at the end of this year and into 2024. That's probably the area we're concentrated most. On the financial side, too, now we think regional banks still probably have estimate declines more likely than rising going forward. But outside of the regional banks, the asset managers, if we're right about the markets that, you know, a general trend upward, they have an opportunity to not only increase from that perspective, but also increase their revenues and, and, and earnings profile as well. Well, Jeremy, when it comes to the recent market rally that we have seen this year, certainly has dealt a blow to short sellers. They saw $120 billion in mark-to-market losses so far this year. That's according to the latest data out from S3 Partners. A lot of the gains, though, Jeremy, that we have seen since the start of the year is from just a couple of names most heavily uh, in the tech sector. What do you make, I guess, of that trend that we are seeing, whether or not that that rally has run too far when it comes specifically to tech? Yeah. With tech specifically, it's it's interesting to a certain extent is that, you know, from the core holdings that have really propelled the market higher, those aren't really heavily shorted names, right? I don't hear a lot about people, you know, shorting Microsoft, right? It, it's not a name that, that that's heavily shorted from that perspective. So what I've been saying more along the lines is, hey, you know, people were looking at these as a little bit of kind of where they could hide out to a certain extent. And then AI propelled that again. And then from an earnings perspective, they haven't given you any reason to sell. They keep either meeting or exceeding their numbers. And so from those top tier perspective, they're doing very well from a fundamental perspective and from an earnings perspective. And then the short selling comes on the other side is as those things go up, you know, the short selling components, that's where you see that acceleration in some of the other names. They're saying they just have to get out of the way because those losses get painful really fast for short sellers.
Jeremy, I got to ask you, in terms of where the market is now, outside of today, we've hit a bull market. Is this kind of a head fake right now, uh, or do you expect this to be this straight line up, if you will, to continue? No. Uh, we never expect linear upward to the right. So it's two different answers there in the effect of, we think we are in a bull market. We think we've seen the bottom. We think September of 2022 was the bottom. Um, but from that perspective, we are gonna chop up and down is that we don't expect this to be a straight up type of rally. Like certainly that we've seen in the last three, four weeks is that it just doesn't tend to work that way over longer periods of time. Expect an area where we see a four or 5% correction and even maybe a little bit worse than that. You know, we could be talking about an eight, nine, 10% correction and not even getting anywhere near where we were last September. So we've done a lot of work up front here that maybe we revert a little bit, but really from a longer term investor perspective, we would be using any of those five to greater than 5% corrections to getting more aggressive because we think the long term secular trend is a little more intact. All right, Jeremy, we're going to leave it there for now, but stick around because in just a few minutes, we're going to be going a little bit deeper here with you. Speaking of maybe ways to invest, you got some stock picks for us and ones to avoid. So we'll talk to you again here in just a few minutes. All right. We have got markets under pressure at the start of the trading week. We've got a holiday shortened trading week. Uh, for more on today's action, let's get over to the New York Stock Exchange with Jared Blickery with a look at some of the top movers of the day. Jared, what are you seeing? Hey, Diane, I'm looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Dow is off the most. Uh, we've been over the indices, so I want to skip straight into uh, some of the longer-term pictures here. Now, here's the S&P 500, and uh, we got a number of analyst notes out today on the general market from UBS, Morgan Stanley, Mike Wilson talking. Um, and Morgan Stanley, uh, a little bit of a mea culpa. They've been wrong all year long uh, in terms of not anticipating the pop and expecting more bearishness. Uh, but in the second half of the year, they still stand by by their belief that the 1.5, up to $1.5 trillion in quantitative tightening, uh, essentially that was supposed to happen before, but is now going to happen in the back half of the year because of what is happening with the Treasury finally getting over the debt limit, debt ceiling, and finally being able to refill its coffers, they expect that to weigh on the market. Nevertheless, check out the price action today in the S&P. After that June liftoff, we are still within this really tight trend channel, and you can see in this little candle, that's today's candle, we have reduced rejected the lower side, so pretty bullish candle uh, just from that perspective as well. Also taking a look at bond market uh, volatility. Uh, this is important and it does affect stocks as well. Bond market volatility on the wane there, so good to see that. Ten-year T-note yield, that's also down about four basis points. Um, but let's head into the general market here, look at some heat maps where we can see retail, that's consumer discretionary, that is the top performing sector of the day followed by healthcare, and we were just talking about healthcare, kind of a big sector. Um, just want to show you over the last two years, now this is the S&P 500 healthcare sector, so a lot of large cap names in here. This is incredibly sideways trading, trading action right here. Um, and you're not gonna see the effects of a lot of the higher flying biotech stocks represented in there. To the downside, we got energy, that's off more than 2%. Behind that is uh, materials, real estate, and tech. Now, let me go over some of the negative-looking uh, heat maps in the market. China is another story. They've decoupled from the U.S. Uh, we all know about their reopening story, which has failed to gather steam. And the authorities there, they cut the uh, they cut their the bank. They cut their main rate by 10 basis points overnight. Market's still looking for some extra stimulus. They haven't really gotten the blanket stimulus. Uh, that they have before. It's been more targeted, but look out for a potential UN devaluation in their near future if history is any guide. Um, also, I mentioned energy was the worst looking sector. Just a quick, quick look there. Halliburton off 3%. And something real quick here, real quick, that popped up on my radar, Bitcoin up 4% over the last 24 hours. And it looks like it's managing a little bit of a break to the upside. Here's a look at a three-month chart. There we go. And you can see, finally breaking to the upside there, guys. All right, Professor Jared, we will have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Meantime, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, we head to the south of France and check in with our Brad Smith and Brian Sazi at the Cannes Lions Festival as they sit down with the chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola. Plus, shares of Nike in the red today as Wall Street analysts trim expectations for fourth quarter earnings. We check in on the sneaker giant later in the hour. And 
With FedEx and Darden set to report earnings this week, we'll discuss what they may reveal about the health of the consumer. That and more when Yahoo Finance returns. Hey guys, go. Brad, uh, Brad. Uh, anyway, I'm Brian Sazi here, Ken Lines for Yahoo Finance. Brad, that class was full about an hour ago. Nonetheless, we're here talking the biggest newsmaker in the game on the French Riviera. Will I am, Kevin Hart, you name it. Brad, I'm just blown away. We're just coming after the Fed meeting. All those billionaire yachts are out there, oh, yeah. and the vibe here is popping. Look, you didn't have to tell them about my class. <laughs> Rihanna taught me, number one. Number two, the economic conversation here with the CMOs and C-suite that are trying to figure out where they're going to generate even more customer demand in a time of a spending downturn for discretionary items. But travel experiences like this, holding up. Cigars later? Sure, why not? Well, they're having fun. As investors eye potential headwinds for the recent market rally, we're looking at potential stock opportunities and names to steer away from. And to do so, we have Jeremy Bryant back with us, Gradient Investments Senior Portfolio Manager. Jeremy, let's get right into this and start with your picks first. Who are your faves? Yeah, um, what we're leaning towards right now is a, a little bit of a derivative play, if you will. Uh, it's Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. And the reason why we say that is that I believe that over the next year, pretty much every new company that's going to be introduced is going to have AI after it. Um, and how these two are going to be affected by that is that I really think that we're at the bottom or bottoming process of the investment banking IPO cycle. And I think if you look at AI right now, it's really favored the incumbents to start, right? Is your more Microsofts, your Alphabets, those types of companies. 
Where I think this evolves to in year two and going forward will be new companies that start up that have technologies, services, applications around AI. And I think there will be somewhat of a frenzy to get out and get public as a result of that. And I think the beneficiaries of that are going to be Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. So from that perspective, they have good wealth management, traditional asset management businesses that I think are still going to be relatively healthy. And then a second wave coming from the IPO side, which should benefit them over the next two to three years. I'd be buying these right now. Jeremy, what is it more specifically? Maybe it might be that wealth management exposure there that you just mentioned. But what makes Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs better positioned in your eyes than their big competitors here, like a city, like a uh, what else do we have? J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, some of those other larger banks. Yeah, very simply is less banking exposure. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that they are not, you know, uh, the city groups, Wells Fargo's of the world. A lot of their revenue, a lot of their earnings comes from the traditional banking structure. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, to be honest with you, Goldman Sachs kind of failed at their, their traditional banking offering, right? Is that they're really pulling back from that and going back to kind of what their core is, if you will. So that's what we want as an opportunity going forward is much more of that investment banking oriented wealth management side. While Citi and Wells will definitely benefit from those kinds of things, the traditional banking side is what we kind of want to have away from to a certain extent to focus on and Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs will just benefit to a greater degree from that. Jeremy, let me ask you a leadership question about both of these banks. So Morgan Stanley, of course, we know their CEO is heading out. They haven't named a successor yet, but one, are you satisfied, you know, given that the trajectory of who's possible, who's being talked about as a potential uh, new CEO? And then, of course, Goldman Sachs. They've been in the hot seat. David Solomon uh, being kind of criticized uh, for his handling of different things. And one of the things, of course, that Goldman is under the microscope about is, is its role with SVB and possibly playing both sides of the coin. You have the government looking at them uh, regarding that. Does that give you any cause for concern? Sure. Always cause for concern, but it's more of a monitoring situation, right? Is that these are not companies that are brand new <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, leadership can certainly have an influence and an impact on what their future trajectory holds. But really, the businesses and the exposures generally tend to win out. And if they're truly destroying capital, there will be an adjustment that will have to be made you know, at the top end. We're going to monitor it. We're going to pay attention to it. We understand it as a, as a risk potential factor there. But really what we're buying is that business exposure. And generally, these companies have, have benefited from those. And we don't think enough of their business has changed to really say that that's not going to happen in the future. All right, Jeremy, let's get to some of your icks here, some of the stocks that you're saying to avoid. Molson Coors was the one that stuck out to me because, quite frankly, it has been a top performer since the start of the year. Why do you see that momentum fading here in the back half? Yeah, uh, a lot of it has been a controversy from a competitive brand, right? That's why people have flocked to this in a market share shift. But really, that's why we're looking at this and saying I would not be buying here now as the stock has massively accelerated this year alone. It's sitting at near five year high valuations. And from my perspective, it does not change the course. While market share could absolutely shift, they may be right in that regard. I don't know yet whether the long term trajectory has changed or not. We'll find out. But what I do know is that the overall industry is still re relatively challenged. The domestic U.S. beer market is still not a, what I would call a growth market by any stretch of the imagination. So from that perspective, that's where it becomes a little bit challenging to say I would be buying here right now. And so from that, you know, if you've made profit in the name, great, good. I would be looking to maybe take that profit. And then secondarily, if I did not own a position, which we do not, I would not be looking to add here right now. Well, you're certainly not contrary to the broader analyst kind of list of uh, where they stand. I mean, look, more than half of analysts see it as a hold. So uh, you fall in line with that. Uh, but let's talk about your other it. Caterpillar's on the list. Explain this one. Yeah. Uh, the cyclical trade might have run a little too far too fast. Uh, that's really kind of the thought there is that we've seen a, 
you know, uh, mid-teens, I believe, uh, rebound off of the recent lows here to where the stock has really propelled higher on just kind of, uh, you know, a, a hope that we're done with the Fed or those kinds of things. But this is a heavy cyclical name, and we don't think that that area is ripe for reacceleration as of yet. And so from our perspective, it's just saying that this is probably not an opportune time to be buying into Caterpillar. We think more likely there's downside in the future, you know, in the next six to 12 months to where if you want to own Caterpillar for the long term trends of growth, you know, whether China comes back and does industrial type of things or whether the U.S. continues to build in the infrastructure, we think there's better entry points down the road than there certainly are right now. All right. Buy the dip. Jeremy Bryan, thank you so much. We appreciate you as usual. Thank you very much. The Fed is exploring ways to move more quickly to address potential issues at banks. This comes on the heels of the regional banking crisis earlier this year. Fed Vice Chair of Supervision Michael Barr suggesting that banks undergo something called reverse stress testing. Here with more on this story, Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomburger. Jen. Hey there, Jana. That's right. Federal Reserve Vice Chair of Supervision Michael Barr says the Fed is exploring so-called reverse stress testing as a tool to try to make banks more resilient. This as the central bank re-examines bank culture in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's failure. Speaking this morning at a conference to the New York Federal Reserve, Barr said, quote, instead of thinking of a stressful scenario and then seeing how it would play out through on, say, the balance sheet of a firm, you look at a bank and you say, well, what would it take to really break this institution? Barr says reverse stress testing could be used as a tool to help supervisors recognize more exogenous issues that could go wrong instead of patterns from the past regulators have been trained to watch. Barr pointed to how regulators were caught off guard when Silicon Valley Bank lost 85 percent of its deposits in just two days, a much faster bank run than what was seen where the fastest bank runs in the past spanned two weeks. Barr said the Fed is looking inward as well as to why it's been so slow to move on supervisory issues and ways to improve that. Recall the Fed flagged issues at Silicon Valley Bank as early as November 2021, but was slow to act to enforce those infractions. Barr gave the example of if there's a governance issue at a bank, having that bank work on the issue, but also putting in place more capital requirements to incentivize that bank to fix the issue faster. Now, Barr's comments coming just a day before Fed Chair Jay Powell testifies to Congress on monetary policy report, where he is expected to be peppered by lawmakers on both sides of the aisle on what sorts of new regulations the Fed is looking at in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank's failure. Back to you. We will hear what he has to say about that tomorrow over the next two days. All right, Jennifer Schomburger, thanks. Well, coming up, Nike shares lower today as Wall Street analysts trim their expectations for their earnings results coming up later this week. We've got more on that for you when we come back. What's good, Yahoo Finance folks? Brian Sazi, Brad Smith, here on La Crosette in Cannes, and we are bringing you full coverage of the Cannes Lions Festival. Did Brian. you see uh, Elon Musk yet? He took, he's taking over an island. He's going to try to sell a lot of stuff on Twitter. I'm going to try and find him the best I can. Tune in. We'll have the search for Elon Musk, apparently. <laughs>
Brian Sazi of Yahoo Finance here, and the millionaires and billionaires are out in Cannes, France for the annual Cannes Lions Conference. They're out here with their toys, like this beautiful Porsche, which I assure you is not mine. Yahoo Finance has some amazing interviews with CMOs, CEOs, you name it. All the power players that control the global and industry are at this conference. Lots of interviews coming up. Inventory shrinkage is a big issue for retailers, mostly at the hands of organized retail crime. Now, Target CEO Brian Cornell telling Yahoo Finance last month that the problem is getting worse and warning that it could cost Target $500 million in profits this year. But despite that, there's one analyst who's saying that this big problem will turn from a headwind to a tailwind later this year. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer is here with more on that. And Josh, explain this to me. This is a note out here from the team uh, at UBS. But what are they saying just in terms of how we are going to see this potentially benefit maybe some investors at some point? Yeah, so the way shrinkage works, right, right, I think we should start there. Overall, you're talking about essentially the companies are losing money and losing profits. So if we were to see shrinkage go down, that $500 million, if we wanted to use that number in theory, at some point would come back to Target, right? So at a high level, that's what UBS is looking at. And really what they're calling here is they're calling peak shrinkage. They're saying this is the most shrink we're going to get. We're reaching it right now. And something interesting they pointed to in that call was a graph showing how often shrink is mentioned on earnings calls. So when you take a look at the past decade or so, when we're talking about shrink, you can see there when it reaches sort of peak, it then falls off pretty significantly, the mentions do, and so does the actual shrink reporting that we then see in the following quarter. So UBS essentially saying, you've heard a lot about shrink in the last couple quarters, specifically the last quarter, you heard it from the likes of Walmart, Target, the dollar stores, Dollar General, Dollar, Dollar Tree. They're now saying that they think that that's gonna fall off in the next couple quarters, so end of 23 probably, into 24, and then you see those profits come back. So if you were to sort of make that right trade now, then the profits come back, the gross margin goes back up, and it's a positive tailwind for the company. Kind of the expectation would be to buy the rumor, sell the news for a situation <laughs> like that. And I do notice more luxury t retailers are trying to address that problem with how they're handling crowds who mm -hmm. or, or uh, I wouldn't call it crowds for luxury retailers, but. <laughs> <laughs> they're never pretty good, though. <laughs> but, you know, how they're managing consumers coming into their stores, right. you know, to uh, deal with that issue. Mm -hmm. But of course, the big retailers can't necessarily do that. And they've been kind of stopping staff from addressing issues that can le lead to uh, the shrink. But I want to pivot a little bit and talk Nike. I saw shares under pressure today. Um, uh, this coming after analysts warn of inventory issues. So tell us about this. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about shrink, you're also kind of talking about inventory in some ways, right? It's a little bit different for Nike, right. but we're st staying with the trend here on inventory. And for Nike, it's been a story over the last couple quarters of just they've had very high inventory a lot of retailers have had very high inventory for Nike specifically what the street has been concerned about is when you go back a month mm -hmm. to that Foot Locker earnings call they talked a lot about sales probably falling through the end of the year they already have a lot of inventory right. who buys a lot of Nike shoes Foot Locker about 70% mm -hmm. of their sales are Nike so that was one thing that analysts were pointing out today but interesting to see that they think overall Nike might be able to hold up in this environment, essentially saying that they think that North American sales are gonna be down, North American inventories might be under pressure, but they might have some success in what they're doing outside oh, of boy. North America, and that can maybe buoy what might be a little bit of a decline here in the States. We will see, we get those results, what, Thursday? Next Thursday. Next Thursday, Next all right, Thursday. so coming up here in right. just over a week. Right, Josh Schaefer, thanks. All right, kicking off the week with some good news in the housing market. Groundbreaking on new homes surging nearly 22% in May, the biggest jump in nearly a year. That's according to the National Association of Home Builders. Building permits also jumped last month, rising over 5% from April. For more on that data, we turn to Jim Tubin, National Association of Home Builders CEO. Uh, I know we've got some good data out, too. And I'm sorry, the housing starts from the government. Uh, let's talk about both uh, data points that we have, both confidence, starts. Uh, it looks like housing is just having a moment more than we expected. How would you characterize what we're seeing right now, Jim? A cautious optimism is uh, is how I would characterize it. We, yesterday, uh, we saw the NHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index uh, jump to 55 points, which puts us in positive territory. Uh, the, the sixth month in a row of, a, of an increase after 12 months of a decline uh, in, in 2023. So definitely our builders' optimism, forward-looking index to the future of the housing market and the strength of the housing market, 
certainly uh, was confirmed today by the, the, the starts and permit numbers. So uh, we are cautiously optimistic that we are we are starting to see that rebound uh, in, in home construction and, uh, and, and housing. Jim, what's fueling that cautious, optimistic, as you put it, outlook here at this point? Because even though it is still cautiously optimistic, it's much better than we have seen in recent months. Well, I think what, what, what we have seen is uh, obviously demand is very, very high for, for housing. And with so, so few existing homes on the market, people are now turning towards new home sales. In fact, new home, newly constructed home sales are making up a larger percentage of the monthly for sale numbers, which means uh, that as people turn towards uh, towards newly constructed homes, we're going to see that our our members and and the builders across the country are going to respond to that, and they're going to put more more supply in the marketplace. And so, um, and, and and then you add on to that the fact that people are starting to get more comfortable with well, what I would say are these elevated uh, interest rates up in the six or seven percent uh, that that's no longer the, a barrier to entry for a lot of people. Yeah, Jim, that used to be the number. So 6% was kind of the number where you saw people saying, hold up, we're not going into this kind of market. Uh, so uh, is your expectation, is, the, is it really right now what we're seeing like an inventory issue? Is that what's fueling uh, the strength that we're seeing or, you know, uh, to a certain degree, the strength that we're seeing in the housing market? We're, we're underbuilt, uh, and, and and we're we're underbuilt, and we have been for the last decade. And I think finally we're in. And demand has remained high, even though we saw a sag last year in demand as interest rates uh, crept up and up, and and people got a little bit nervous about how high they would go. As we've reached this plateau, uh, it's clear that people are willing to re-enter the market uh, at at this uh, at this interest rate level, and and I and. I just think that demand remains high, and and as as long as local, uh, state, and federal lawmakers are willing to create the regulatory environment that allow us to deliver homes at an affordable price, I think we're going to see this in a sustained level for the next uh, the next little while. What are you seeing just in terms of the incentives that builders are offering uh, to attract buyers? Is something we've been talking about for the last couple of months. Is that still the case? And what are they doing now? Well, we, we are actually in the numbers that we're watching. We're seeing the incentives, not only the number of builders who are offering incentives, but also the incentives themselves are dropping. Which means to me uh, that that the that the the public is willing to come into the marketplace and doesn't need those incentives to get over the goal line to purchase a home. Uh, so that I think is a good sign about the health of the of the marketplace, but also importantly the health of the home buyer out there. So that that's a that's a one positive sign we've seen uh, that's breaking a recent trend. Speaking of the health of the home buyer, there has been an affordability issue when it comes to some of the homes on the market, you know. So what are you seeing in terms of ways to address that issue? Well, I think when it comes to affordability, it's firstly when it, when we talk about the construction of new homes, it's, it starts and ends with regulatory burdens on, on the construction of homes. Uh, you know, local governments uh, put, put time delays in, in front of builders. Uh, regulatory burdens, even at the federal level, uh, those all drive up the cost of housing. Uh, and then you have to think. You also have to think about the supply chain. We have not fully resolved the supply chain bottlenecks in all of the building materials out there. Nor uh, have we seen inflation drop all the way back down to the Fed's target rate of two percent. So there still continues to be supply chain concerns out there as well. And then the last piece, of course, is is how builders finance their homes, and that's through the acquisition, development, and construction lending in the in the country, uh, traditionally done by community banks. Uh, that lending is 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 much more expensive, and the availability of that credit uh, has gotten tighter over the last six months. So, with all that, Jim, taken into account, that what do you think the housing market looks like by the end of the year, given the fact that there are still so many, it sounds like, challenges here presented uh, to the industry. Well, again, it's it's like I call on policymakers to to try to do what they can to lessen that regulatory burden on housing and move more housing production uh, into the pipeline faster. I, I am encouraged by the numbers that we've seen, not only over the last six months with our builder sentiment, but now these permit and starts numbers point to, again, a cautious uh, optimism for the second half of this year. And I'm optimistic that we'll uh, we'll see the, 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 the market uh, and the construction center continue to rebound through 2023 and then really start to take off in 2024. All right. We appreciate that look ahead and also the analysis of what has come today. Jim Tobin, our thanks to you so much. Thank you.
Coming up, we head out to the south of France and check in with our Brad Smith and Brian Sazi at the Cannes Lions Festival as they sit down with the chief marketing officer for Coca-Cola. We won't want to miss that conversation. Welcome back to Can Lions Festival of Creativity. Brad Smith, Brian Sazi, and now we're joined by the Chief Marketing Officer of Coca-Cola, Manolo Arroyo. Great to have you here. Thank us. you. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. All right. Well, first, you've got the Coca-Cola in your hand. I mean, you're too cool for school right now. You're staying ice cold out here as we're seeing the sun start to open up a little bit more. You talk about the reach of the consumer base and and the number of people that play into that marketing function as influencers too, whether direct or indirect, and, and one of those indirect ones has been Warren Buffett. You've also had indirect ones such as former presidents of the United States. So for, for better or worse, it's, it's kind of going into a next or even amid a polarizing time right now where one influencer can be looked at or perceived differently than another. How does Coca-Cola manage its own brand perception despite who's talking about it? I think the critical component is to have clarity of what you stand for. And it all starts by being extremely respectful to the heritage of what the brand has done in the past. This is one of the most, if not the most, inclusive brand in the planet. It stands for phenomenal human values such as optimism, happiness, freedom, peace. At the time in which we, the world needed peace, we claim please be in peace. And, and that got us to where we are. Now, if you stick into just the old territory, you won't be expanding the meaning that would make the relevance required so to trigger transition or conversion from non-consumers into consumers. And that's where you need to craft very carefully how you're gonna grow about it. We have identified a series of um, potential triggers of that conversion. For some humans are about um, 
consumption occasions. Why is that the case? Well, everyone understands that maybe why you should drink a Coke and what are the benefits as a product. A lot of times you don't understand where and when it's appropriate. You're missing the context. And that works for quite some people. An example of that is connecting Coca-Cola to meals, you know, meal, meals occasions. We're getting significant new incidents of new consumers coming into the franchise through association with meals. The second bucket is around passion points. We all have different passion points. And that's where um, uh, topics like music, gaming, traveling, sports, uh, play a significant role in driving some of that conversion. For a portion of the population today, particularly Gen Z, uh, in certain markets, ESG, your level of commitment on ESG, it matters. And for others, it's innovation. So we're playing with all of those different conversion drivers or factors that um, will ultimately allow us to accelerate uh, what we're trying after, uh, going after, which is basically growth. Right. The name of the game for us is, is growth. This year, how much will you spend on marketing? How does it, and how does that compare to next year? And then if this brand is in fact about optimism and peace, how are you thinking about your budget next year for election season when we might see an election that is anything but peaceful and optimistic? Um, well, we, we don't disclose specifically our marketing budget, but as you can imagine, there's official sources out there and you could think it's in the, in the multi-billion dollar magnitude. Now, bear in mind that one piece is what we invest in marketing, and then there's the other piece that is equally important, which is what our bottlers invest in marketing, which is a similar, roughly the same amount. So that gives you a tremendous marketing muscle. Factor in that not only the paid media, but what we define as own media or earned media. And part of that is 30 million outlets, which we serve and we touch every single week of the year in every one of the countries that exist out there except three. More than 10 million coolers in those 30 million outlets. Thousands and thousands of trucks that are moving, they're, they're out, moving outdoor uh, uh, connection points that we're leveraging in our marketing. So the ecosystem of the engagement points that allow us to reach millions and millions of consumers is just, is just phenomenal. Now, your question on the US. US represents, roughly speaking, I'm just gonna round the number, around 15% of our business. And um, it, it's obviously, from a marketing perspective, uh, uh, important and very critical because it's extremely visible. And it's a market that we see tremendous growth potential, tremendous growth potential. We've seen in the last, a uh, couple of years, uh, uh, very interesting dynamics, not only in Coca-Cola trademark, but across the whole portfolio. We've seen explosive growth in Fairlife, in um, uh, Sprite, in hydration. So it's really off to a great start in the US. Now, next year, it'll be a, a, a very important year. As it relates to public or political potential controversy and how we a play there is very simple answer. We, we, we don't play in that. But do you want to see an ad for Coke products next to stories, for example, on a digital property regarding the election? How, and how do you handle that? Well, obviously, we, from a brand safety standpoint, we have very, very clear guidelines. Very clear guidelines. We're going to stay away from any major controversy because there's a principle here, as I mentioned before, we, we are the most inclusive brand. This brand is for everyone. In our employees, we have not only our company employees, are, with our bottling employees, we reach close to a million employees around the world. So our diversity of opinions from a political, sexual preference, uh, ideology, you name it, it, it's, it, it, it's as wide and as big as the population in any given country, including the US. And we welcome everyone. We've always welcomed everyone. Now, we can't avoid that people have their own opinion and that's gotta be respectful. Our employees do as well. Uh, but when it comes to our marketing communications, we are taking a, um, uh, a position of inclusion. That's what we stand for. It, it's a value that transcends um, in our view 
uh, what's out there and it's more important because ultimately uh, what we're saying is we're a simple beverage which is a bre we're just a soft drink uh, and you know don't, don't expect too much of a soft drink <laughs> just I mean who are we right so just enjoy it have fun have fun and enjoy the pleasure of it well, one thing that people are having increasingly more fun with is some of your canned cocktails right now. Mm. Uh, we've seen a couple of those being passed around here, especially as people are getting saucy at canned this year. When you think about how much you would like to allocate towards that part of your growing business in either marketing spend or just consumption as a metric that you're tracking, what does success look like? You mean in, in our latest experiments in the portfolio? Yes. Um, we, we've been experimenting over the last, we started three years ago, actually. Um, September, October, September uh, 2020, actually. Um, and, and we are very, very happy with the results of those experiments. We're still in the learning of, uh, in the process of, of learning how the category plays. We see um, clear potential. We still are shaping the line of sight of how that could become potentially and how big it could become uh, for us in our portfolio, we still are in the process of having those discussions internally and, 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 and basically firming up our investment and our uh, plans for the future. But we see it as a, uh, as a promising category because it, that's where the consumer is going. Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or not, uh, and this is maybe unknown, if you go to the archives of, of our archives in Coca-Cola, there are materials that associate not only Coca-Cola, but some of the of other brands, Sprite, for example, to different uh, beverage options in those consumption occasions. So it's not something new. We've been doing some of that since. So it, Sprite it had alcohol at one point. Not in the product itself, huh. but communicating. For example, you know, we got 1960s uh, communication materials of a Sprite with vodka, hmm. uh, and obviously, you know, Cuba Libre, uh, rum and coke. It's been part, as you may have heard. Uh, of our legacy for, for decades. Uh, at different points of time, the levels of activation only in the outlets and only in the trade where it sells and is authorized to sell that have been um, having had different degrees of execution depending on the country as well. But moving forward, we see, uh, particularly not in, maybe not in the whole world, but in certain markets, we see that the consumer is going there the credentials and the credibility of our brands to play a role there, a rights to win, we define, are, are, are very clear. Well, you'll be pleased to know that a rum and coke is one of my go-to cocktails that is out there. Why, why do you like it? Why, why do, do I like, like it? it? Yeah. Well, because it's the coke. It's the coke. It sets off the drink. It's great. It's not because of the rum. It's because of the coke. <laughs> it's because of the coke. <laughs> That's the right answer. Just say no coke. Right. My boss is listening. It's because of the coke. I love it. <laughs> Manolo Arroyo, who is the chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola, joining us here at Ken. We'll send it back to you. All right, our thanks to Brad and Brian over at the Cannes Lions Festival in the south of France. Well, AI technologies in healthcare are intended to improve patient experience and enhance productivity. But according to a recent survey by GE, there's some skepticism around it. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani joining us now with more and on. What are we learning just in terms of the biggest concerns? Well, Shauna, as you might expect, healthcare is one of those areas where people are a little bit more careful about the use of any kind of digital tools. And it's been one of the areas where there have been a lot of obstacles. In particular, this survey highlighted the trust in AI as well as the biases that come about and how clinicians feel about that in general. 42% say that it can be trusted globally, but when you look at the U.S. alone, that drops to just 26%. Meanwhile, 55% say AI is not ready for medical use, and patients don't even feel that their health data is secure yet. And so that's obviously one of the biggest barriers yet, uh, is how the electronic world treats health data, which people you know, consider one of the most private pieces of information out there. Uh, there are also uh, other factors to consider about the use of AI in healthcare right now, including what is going on in the health field. We know that doctors are burned out. There are increasingly clinicians who are talking about actively leaving the field, 42% according to the same survey from GE Healthcare, as well as uh, patients and clinicians commenting that they're not comfortable with care outside of, a, of the clinic just yet. So even with the popularity of things like a virtual healthcare, we have still seen a pushback towards 
in clinic treatment from both sides, clinicians and patients. So that all really tells a story of really needing more focus on how these tools are rolled out. And this, of course, is coming at a time where we know lawmakers are calling for regulation of AI. And the FDA's own commissioner, Dr. Califf, has openly commented on the fact that there aren't enough uh, people with knowledge on how to regulate the industry, especially when it comes to healthcare. So it's going to be an interesting road ahead for this industry in particular. I spoke to GE Healthcare's Chief Technology Officer, Dr. Taha uh, Koskut, and he noted, uh, Koskut, sorry, and he noted that um, the delay in the industry uh, may be long, but hopefully not as long as when the thermometer was invented. A nice little quote there from him, noting that when Fahrenheit invented the thermometer, it took 100 years for it to be adopted and trusted, and hopefully it won't take 100 years for AI. So, you know, basically sit tight and wait and see how this all pans out. We know that AI is such a big topic right now. And healthcare is definitely one area where many tech hurdles remain in order for it to be adopted. Certainly is a very popular topic and also a priority here for the Biden administration. We know President Biden is meeting with some AI experts to discuss some of those risks presented from the technology today. Anj Kamlani, thanks so much. All right, well, coming up, almost time for the closing bell on Wall Street. We're still looking at losses across the board. The Dow now off just over 200 points. We'll be right back. And that's the closing bell here on Wall Street with all three of the major averages ending the day in the red. The Dow closing off just over 240 points. S&P below 4,400, off just about 20 points here. The Nasdaq off about a tenth of a percent. Sector-wise, 10 of the 11 S&P sectors closing the day in the red. The biggest losses coming from energy, the XLE off just about 3%.
Let's take a look at some of those individual movers of the day. First up, we got to take a look at Alibaba. Shares closing the day lower off just around 4.5% after the company announced that Daniel Zhang will be stepping down as CEO and chairman. Eddie Wu, one of Alibaba's co-founders, will take over as CEO. And Josai will succeed Zhang as a chairman. Now, Zhang will continue to lead Alibaba's cloud division as the e-commerce giant plans to split its business here into six business units, but you can see the reaction, yep. uh, Diane, in shares today. And I think the takeaway here from investors is that they want to see growth here before they are eager to jump back into a name like Alibaba. Growth. Also, this was a surprise. So uh, Wall Street certainly doesn't like a surprise like this, especially at the top of the food chain. I mean, one good thing for, you know, when you're talking about, say, Jason Wu, he was uh, tied to Jack Ma. So there is a close relationship to their, uh, there. So uh, maybe he can handle this kind of shifting of how the restructuring, uh, if you will. But we've certainly seen Alibaba take a knock when you're looking at it, whether it's, you're talking about year to date or on a uh, year ago basis, down double digits from a year ago when you talk about that kind of China crackdown on uh, the Internet uh, names like Alibaba. All right. Shares of Avis budget group riding higher. That stock rallying nine percent uh, this uh, after Morgan Stanley upgrading the vehicle rental company to overweight from equal weight, raising its price target to 230 bucks from 182. Analyst Adam Jonas says Avis has shown its quote uh, able to not only extract higher revenues, but also lower costs and subsequently higher margins from their operations. This is kind of like uh, it, it, seeing it as a normalizing of the rental uh, vehicle market. I yeah, mean. certainly. We have seen that demand is high here for travel. People are out there renting cars. When it comes to Avis, though, specifically, another thing that jumped out uh, to me from this note here from Jonas was he was saying that Avis has a proven track record of managing fleet costs or managing those risks there and keeping a lid on costs. Obviously, that would be good news here for investors for the bottom line here of Avis. His new price target of 230 bucks that you just mentioned, that would imply about a 13 percent jump from the closing price right. yesterday. So we saw a bit of a move higher here today, up just about 9%, but he still thinks there's a little bit more runway here with shares mm -hmm. closing just around 224. Let's take a look at Nike, one of the worst performers in the Dow today, closing off about 3.5%. A couple of Wall Street analysts trimming their expectations for fourth quarter earnings next week. So Nike telling investors in its last quarter that it, that it thought that it had turned a corner on inventory. But a note out here from Morgan Stanley, the team there today, warning that Nike's inventory comeback might not be as strong as, as they had initially yep. anticipated. The inventory growth, 16% last quarter. That was a massive improvement yeah. from the quarter before. But we know that retailers yes. across the industry still struggling with those higher inventory problems. Right, and some of the concern really in particular about this is its wholesale client, meaning Foot Locker. So we know Foot Locker talked about its inventory issues. So now Morgan Stanley seeing the knock-on effect there as well. And also uh, UBS analysts uh, uh, talking about Nike sneaker sales slowing as well. Uh, so we're certainly seeing some damage that stock getting dented today. Now, let's take a look at the oil market amid rising uncertainty over China's economy. Here with the latest look is uh, you're looking at uh, WTI crude oil and Brent crude, uh, both down on the day, uh, West Texas Intermediate down a little over a percent. Uh, but we have Inez Ferre with a bigger breakdown. Take us through it, Inez. <laughs> Yeah, Diane, and part of this really has to do with the recovery in China and the nonlinear recovery, really, as it has been, or a whimper of a recovery, as some would say it has been so far. China has uh, taken some stimulus measures. Uh, it has cut some key lending rates recently. And so that is to shore up their economy. And some experts are saying perhaps that is not enough to shore up their economy. But this has really been sort of a disappointment for the oil markets which were sort of banking on China to be able to recover, roar back from its lockdowns, uh, COVID lockdowns last year. You have exports and imports in China that have fallen, factory activity that it shrinks. And so you are seeing pressure 
on oil over the last weeks. And despite, in fact, also output uh, cuts from OPEC Plus, remember that in early April, OPEC Plus announced a surprise output cut. Then Saudi Arabia earlier this month had announced that it would be doing it alone and also cutting some production. Nevertheless, you have seen oil year to date. I'm going to show you a chart here for Brent crude, for example. This was in early April with, with that surprise cut. Well, it has fallen since then. So these cuts that OPEC Plus has have done uh, have sort of put a floor, tried to put a floor on the oil market, but they haven't been necessarily that effective. And this is because of concerns of demand going forward. You also have Russian oil that has seeped into the market as well. That has put uh, uh, prices lower as well. So uh, nevertheless, demand. That is what going forward is concerning these oil markets. And you're seeing it also in oil related stocks. I'm going to pull up the XLE that Shauna was mentioning earlier. XLE, the worst performer today. Year to date, it is also the worst performer, down about 10% year to date. And remember, this is a reversal of what we saw last year, where XLE was the outperformer, the best performer. And you can see tech and communication services this year taking the lead, guys. Well, certainly a reversal fortune there. Ness Farrell, thank, for a, excuse me. <laughs> thank you so much. Ness, I've known you for years. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Coming up, a fresh delivery of earnings from FedEx. We dive into those numbers on the other side. Brian Sazi, Brad Smith, Yahoo Finance fam, you know what it is. We're here at Can Lions in France, where we're bringing you coverage all week with the leading CEOs and CMOs of some of the household brands you know and love. With all these ad execs here, Brad, I think I just have to buy something from someone. What are you going to get? I don't know. Maybe a drink.
Brad, here's my hand. It's empty. Where's our producer with our drinks? We're baking out here at Can Lions. You can have the rest of mine. Oh, Dag, you're a good guy. Uh, sharing is caring. And guess what? We're sharing some of the best interviews that we could book for everyone who's watching Yahoo Finance this week. Guess what? You've got CEOs, CMOs, entertainers of the year. Everyone's coming your way. It's a tough life. Somebody's got to do it. All right, let's take a look at FedEx releasing its latest earnings results. They're looking at shares off just about 5% here in extended trading. A mixed report from the company. Revenue missing expectations, $21.9 billion. They did beat, though, on profit adjusted EPS of 494 for the quarter. The estimate was for 489 In terms of the guidance, full year or 2024 adjusted EPS guidance coming in a bit light. The street was looking for $18.31. FedEx giving a guide of $16.50 to 1850 so at the lower end there of that range disappointing the street we're looking at the stock off just about 5% here in extended trading. Also big news out here in terms of an executive uh, shakeup. CFO Mike Lenz, he is going to retire. That's effective at the end of July, on July 31st. Now the company is saying that, the, that an external search is underway for a new CFO. But CFO Mike Lenz retiring effective July 31st. All right, joining us now for more on FedEx earnings is PPAC Private Wealth Management Managing Principal and Senior Portfolio Strategist David Dietz. Let's first start with that fresh news about its CFO uh, planning to retire. David, what do you make of it? Uh, well, it's never good news when a CFO retires. It's one of the most important positions in a company. We need to get a little bit more insight on that. But of course, it is in the context of a major restructuring going on at FedEx. They've been under pressure from activists and trying to deal with a fall off in demand post COVID-19. And uh, so they're trying to get several different divisions in, uh, in FedEx down into one. And maybe this Maybe the CFO wasn't quite on board. So uh, uh, so we need to learn more. But at first blush, it's certainly not a positive. David, you're a shareholder here of FedEx. How are you looking at some of the changes that the company has planned to make or has really made so far in terms of the cost cutting efforts? But still, though, that 2024 adjusted EPS guidance coming in a bit light when you compare it to the $18.31 the estimate that the street was looking for. Well, certainly we like the restructuring and efficiency efforts that's going on. You know, the one FedEx movement where they're going to consolidate several units, FedEx Ground, FedEx Express into one, makes all the sense in the world. And of course, this is also in the context of belt tightening because, of course, everything got bloated and very, um, very comfortable during the pandemic boom of everyone ordering uh, online. But now with we're getting past the pandemic, there is a drop off in demand. So that's another reason why it's so important to, to cut these costs. In terms of going forward, there's an initial disappointment here, but I really want to learn more as to what the basis is for their uh, reduced guidance here. Is it concerns about the macroeconomy, geopolitical issues, inflation, potential recession, or are they starting to see uh, some resistance in terms of the uh, traction that they're getting with their uh, uh, cost-cutting efficiencies and so forth. That's what we want to look at closely. Is it a read for the global economy or is it more company specific? Let's talk about revenue. So reven revenue came in weaker than expected, David, uh, speaking of the economy. And we know FedEx, like UPS, considered an economic bellwether. What does it tell you about the state of the consumer? Uh, well, well, certainly, uh, particularly at the lower end, consumers are feeling inflation. There's just no question about it. And so I think there is a drop off in demand. But of course, you also have to tease out the changes in people's buying habits uh, post COVID-19. You know, when we were all locked down, everything we did was sit around at home and order online. FedEx brought it to our door. But now, as we're getting past that, people are enjoying getting back out to Main Street, getting back out to the mall and doing their shopping in person. Obviously, that does not help FedEx's demand. So, you know, uh, to that extent, you can say that's not FedEx's fault. That's just part of the macro economy. They won a lot during COVID-19. Now there's a little bit of a payback. When it comes to their forecast here for flat to low a single digit revenue growth for fiscal 2024, how is FedEx positioned or how does it stack up against this obvious large arrival out there, UPS? Um, well, uh, you know, it is a nice duopoly. And of course, they have DHL, this uh, part of the troika of competitors over in Europe. Um, so it's a very cozy relationship. 
Um, of course, what we're seeing here is that uh, inflation and wage pressures uh, abound here, and that's going to put uh, a lot of pressure on, on the bottom line. Um, and so UPS, of course, has already announced that they're soon to go into contract negotiations. I think FedEx has one big advantage over UPS because they're not unionized. Nevertheless, their workers will be watching closely what the opportunities look like over at unionized UPS. That will put pressure there. In terms of the top line, uh, you know, with the Fed potentially raising uh, rates twice more, with several major economies around the world, like China and Japan, staying very loose on their monetary conditions, it's hard for them to get too aggressive about what they see in terms of global demand going forward. I like the idea that they're staying a little bit more conservative. Potentially, they can beat going forward. So, okay, David, the stock obviously taking a hit, a, a knee-jerk reaction before the earnings call. Uh, do you still like it as a value, like, like its valuation uh, where it stands right now? Yeah, you know, short term, I'm just a little cautious. This is a stock which has reported earnings and revenues down year over year. And yet it's up 34% year to date. It's up 48% since they had a big earnings um, uh, shortfall in September. And so, you know, it's hard for a stock just to keep going up uh, more than 30% when they're reporting negative year over year results. So I think a little give back was to be expected. Of course, the overall markets had quite a, a, a run here. Nevertheless, historically, FedEx, of course, as a, a logistics company, is a cyclical player. It sinks from a lower valuation to a higher valuation. Historically, the stock has risen to the point where it's about one to one point time time sales. Right now, it's just about 70 percent of that. So I think longer term investors can be rewarded. Of course, FedEx has a system that just can't be duplicated. It's been around since the 1970s. It's seen a lot of ups and downs. It's going to weather whatever the global economy throws at it. So I like it as a long term core holding in people's portfolios. All right, David Dietz, we appreciate the deep dive on both the earnings and, of course, reaction to fresh news of CFO Mike Land set to retire. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. AI is a top priority for President Biden, and today the president is in San Francisco meeting with AI experts as the administration looks to manage risks of the new technology. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley following this story of us. And Dan, what are we learning here? And I guess what does this tell you just about the priority and the approach here from the Biden administration when it comes to some of those risks that are associated with AI? Yeah, so there's there's a few things here. I think uh, first is the, the risks that should be discussed. Those are the short-term risks, uh, including disinformation, misinformation. Uh, we saw some of that already where there was an image that was floated around uh, purporting to show an explosion near the Pentagon, but was completely fake, it was uh, a uh, generative AI produced image. And it did kind of rattle the markets for a second. I think the other thing to talk about is how this will impact jobs. Um, that's something that a lot of folks obviously are, are focusing on. Uh, but there is some of the benefit there where, you know, productivity could be increased. So, uh, you know, copyright issues are coming up as well, whether or not uh, artists will be properly uh, reimbursed for their work being used to train these models. So there's there's a lot going on here with, with the potential risks. And that seems to be what uh, the Biden administration wants to discuss here today. Uh, but it does come after they had met with some leaders uh, in the AI space to talk about uh, the technologies and how they want to make sure that the U.S. is, you know, kind of leading the way while also mentioning some of the potential problems there as well. All right, Dan Halley, thank you so much. Great insight. Coming up, we're going around the horn and breaking down some of today's top stories and trending tickers. Stick around. Hey, guys, go. Brad, oh, Brad. Uh, anyway, I'm Brian Sazi here. Can lines for Yahoo Finance. Brad, that class was full about an hour ago. Nonetheless, we're here talking the biggest newsmaker in the game on the French Riviera. Will I am, Kevin Hart, you name it. Brad, I'm just blown away. We're just coming after the Fed meeting. All those billionaire yachts are out there, oh, yeah. and the vibe here is popping. Look, you didn't have to tell them about my glass. <laughs> Rihanna taught me, number one. Number two, the economic conversation here with the CMOs and C-suite that are trying to figure out where they're going to generate even more customer demand in a time of a spending downturn for discretionary items. But travel experiences like this holding up. Cigars later? Sure, why not?
What's going on everyone? We are ripping through the streets of Cannes, France here at the Cannes Lions Festival of Creativity. Brad Smith, Brian Sazi, we've got you covered all week long with some of the interviews that you need to know and potentially market moving commentary from some of the CMOs who are telling us about how much they're spending on advertising right now. We'll be right back. How's it, how does it start? Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Lab. Let's take a look at some trending stories today. I'm joined by Ali, Diane, and Josh. So I'm looking at Rivian. A I domino, like a domino dropping today. Uh, Rivian signing up with Teslas mm -hmm. now, now, now with their EV charging network. It's following Ford and GM in the same kind of slot here. Yep. And I think it's sort of showing that the Tesla NACS standard is becoming the de facto normal standard now. A third manufacturer signing up for that. I think that it kind of shows and kind of goes to show you why that Tesla's network is such an important kind of game changing factor because it's mm -hmm. reliable mm -hmm. and also it's available. I right. think that's what's going on here. Well, it's, a te it's really just such a win for Tesla when you think about the pitch has always been for Tesla investors is more than the car, right? Mm -hmm. They were early in EVs. You're buying, when you buy Tesla, you're getting more than just it's a car company. It's an AI company, company now. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how far I'm going down that road, but I, I mean, know plenty of people are. Yes. I know plenty of people are. But to win the Charger thing, I mean, you see another 5% up today. Stock's up about 50% over the last month as that was right. Ford and GM investments have also boosted that. It's just been interesting to see people start to think about Tesla in that bigger picture now, and that stock has just been on an absolute Yeah, you clearly cannot year. bet against Elon Musk. And I mean, this is this seems to be more of the, if you can't beat them, join them kind of play, mm -hmm. you know, because we were surprised first. Uh, I think it was Ford that was first, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, Russ, right? Yeah, Ford out of, out of nowhere shocked yes, the industry, yeah. exactly, in that Twitter spaces, you know, and because it was like, what is this chat going to be about? And it turned out it was a partnership, mm -hmm. you know, strange bedfellows kind of partnership. And then you had GM following suit, so that was a wild one, you know, to me to just see this, you know, just like you said, the domino effect happening there, right? Yeah, yeah and also Tesla superchargers, they account for about 60% of total fast chargers available in the U.S., according to the Department of Energy. So it does make sense that all of these other companies would try and leverage that because in order to create your own network of chargers, that takes a lot of money and a very heavy investment at a time when you're not getting a ton of returns on these EV vehicles. So to me, it makes perfect sense. Could you imagine if everything you charge from your phone to your AirPod yeah. case was standard? Standardized? Yeah. I would love that. That'd be amazing. <laughs> so I wonder if this is a start mm -hmm. to maybe more of that. Yeah, definitely. not enough. And I know a lot of times we talk to with different uh, analysts, et cetera, within the uh, EV space about the range anxiety. So they're certainly going to have to build out the network more. And it does make sense, though, that Tesla's the leader here. Well, Pross, what's the read through for a company like EVgo and some of the companies that sort of went in on all in on charging? I know that's probably something you've been looking into. I'm curious just how, how people, people are, are seeing, seeing those names people. now. You know, I, you know, think, I think they, they are, are the big losers here. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. You know, they've been betting on the CCS sort of standard connector there. Uh -huh. Now that Tesla is the basically their competitor, and and they have a bigger footprint, they are a, the ease of use is much better with Tesla, and the fact that all these manufacturers are getting on board, it's kind of like not a death knell, but it's sort of making it very hard for them to compete without going fully on the NACS standard as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a good point. Yeah. All right. I want to talk about a story that I'm watching. This is in the retail sector. It's like the age of the easy return is over, apparently. Look, the journal did a deep dive on this and about, you know, we went through this period of revenge shopping where people were just out in, for, in force and we had those easy return policies. You had these different retailers with liberal policies, but now a lot of the retailers are doing this um, kind of a, a final sale, like you can't return this. I mean, this is this is not an option. And so it's making a shift to the resale market, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you're seeing a, a big surge 
and the amount of items that are being sold on, say, like a Poshmark, right, Allie? Right, exactly. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that there's a lot of inventory buildup for a lot of these retailers. So now they're clamping down and saying, okay, this is final sale. But honestly, the return aspect is one of the reasons why I don't really online shop because the thought of returning something just overwhelms me. I, I don't know if I'm in the minority there. Maybe I am, but that's one of the reasons why I don't online shop. And I feel like this final sale is what I do anyway. I truly Read it like a final sale with online shopping. <laughs> so not super. Uh, so it's interesting, though, to see a lot of these companies committing to that. Now, I like right? the final sale of places that I shop a lot. So like mm -hmm. I shop at Lululemon a lot. They do their We Made Too Much is always final sale. But if you're buying the pants or shirts that you wear a lot and you can get 20% yeah, off. Yeah, deals. Yeah. And that, so it's kind of perfect for that. And it's also good for their business, right? Because they can get consistent customers that know their size that they can just sell to and offload inventory that way. So I think you're seeing some retailers sort of take advantage of repeat customers in that sense and kind of keep coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm a little surprised the article mentioned that people were they didn't know it was final sale. I'm like, come on. Right. But you, oh, it you always can see that. Yeah. It, it doesn't see that. It yeah. always like, doesn't So I'm always like, that's a roll in the dice, right? Usually, but I, I find the convenience of buying and being able to return for free, amazing, right? Like yeah. Zappos, things like that. If they make it easy. Sometimes yeah. they don't, some of they, these companies. They don't always make it easy, but I am not, I hear what you're saying about not being completely surprised about that, but sometimes you're just going in and grab pieces because you have, this might be a woman thing, so I don't mean to gender this, <laughs> but like you're grabbing things for an event, you're like, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Let me just grab this, mm -hmm. I'll see what fits at home, and deal with it later. And then you're like, oops, I I'm definitely have to deal not, with it differently. I've never called clothing a piece, so <laughs> I don't know if I've had that. I gotta say one thing, I returned one, something one time, it was UPS, I'd send it to USPS, I never Stop. saw it again. <laughs> never saw it again. Too, because some people go. partner with certain delivery services. I just, you know, dropped it off. I know, I right? like it. Well, from online shoppers to moviegoers, I'm it. watching Pixar and really the bomb that was Elemental this past mm -hmm. weekend. Only notched 28.5 million in its domestic yep. debut over the long weekend. The worst opening for Pixar in its 28 year history. We talk a lot about these Pixar films like Disney's Strange World that mm -hmm. was in Thanksgiving. Yep. Uh, then we had another film, Lightyear, that was a Toy Story prequel yep. last summer. I know, it didn't do as well as didn't expected. Didn't do well. It just kept bombing and it seems like Disney has lost its mojo a bit right. with Pixar and these animated films and you wonder how the studio can get it back moving yeah, forward. Yeah, missed opportunity to the magic. That lost, <laughs> lost the magic. magic. Exactly. Or it's out of its element. That's right, another exactly. one. <laughs> we got to throw in all the puns here. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, it was a big investment they made in Elemental. I mean, we were talking a $200 million investment mm -hmm. to bomb at the box office. Not a good look for Disney at all. And then, yeah, Pixar has come under a lot of scrutiny for some of the things that they're, you know, pushing forward. I think I've seen talk about another Toy Story, and people are like, hey, hang on a second. Wasn't the last one supposed to be? Toy Story 3 was supposed to be the last one. You the know Toy that, Story. Well, or, you know, they should just make so it they're, exactly. Story. They're that's like, okay, back. exactly. The that's probably what's going to happen. Hits, right? But I think that's overall what you're seeing when you think about a holiday weekend, generally a holiday weekend for a lot of people is Father's Day weekend as well. Normally that should be good for moviegoers and movie theaters. But I think a lot of times now you just need a better movie. Mm -hmm. Like that's what's getting people in. It's mm -hmm. not about having a three day weekend or wanting to have a family day. It's, right. You need to actually have an Oppenheimer or a Barbie that come out a month from now. Curious to see what those premieres do. And if that is, if it's not about the weekend itself and it's just about the movie being high quality or the movie having a lot of hype. I'm a little yeah. surprised that Lightyear, di Lightyear disappointed. I know. This movie disappointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of parents there, a lot of kids want to go out and see these movies. I'm shocked that these kids are not, do not doing that well. Is it more of a, Ali, is it more of a, like, a well, not a IP generated, like, you I know what I mean? Like a, like a sequel generated thing. There are a few issues here. I think one is the fact that Disney had this strategy during the pandemic and really through 2022 to put movies on Disney+. On Plus. Mm -hmm. So there was this confusion, okay, what movies are going to be in theaters? Which movies are going to be on Disney+. Plus? And a lot of these kids are seeing the movie. You're really targeting the parents here. Yeah. So if the parents Parents think it's coming out on Disney Plus. They're not taking their kids. No. Another thing is marketing. You brought up yeah. Oppenheimer and Barbie. That's had stellar right. marketing, which is yeah. why we're talking about it all the time. A lot of these movies, and in particular Elemental, didn't have that must-see right. in the theater 
type of marketing that I think it could have. So marketing. Also, keep in mind this is a fairly new holiday. We're just the third yeah. year in experiencing this as a holiday weekend. So I think families are still trying to figure out what to do with what this do we weekend. Do, right? do what we do travel? We do? Yeah. do we go to the movies? You know, mm -hmm. how do we play this? Do we do a picnic, a Juneteenth picnic? You know, so I think families are still trying to figure out their footing. What do we do with a weekend like this? Right. A new three. We are happy to have a new three day weekend. <laughs> but it won't always be right. Like, right. isn't it going to move? Like, so next. Next year it'll be we're off on a Tuesday, right? So it won't be a three-day weekend. Which, I mean, the same I mean, thing I don't know happens the, with the Fourth of July. So, so you wonder how the studios are going to structure their summer movie releases right. moving forward. Whether this will be a big driver of a weekend or whether Fourth of July is going to yeah. be the main one. Always a great roundtable, guys. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to put a pin in our conversation. See what happens next weekend with Elemental and Disney. I don't know, not high hopes. But coming up, you're going to want to stay with us for this one. We've got a big interview coming from Khan with the one and only Kevin Hart of Heartbeat Productions. Stay with us. What's good, Yahoo Finance folks? Brian Sazi, Brad Smith, here on La Crosette in Cannes, and we are bringing you full coverage of Cannes Lions Festival. Did Brian. you see uh, Elon Musk yet? He took, he's taking over an island. He's going to try to sell a lot of stuff on Twitter. I'm going to try and find him the best I can. Tune in. We'll have the search for Elon Musk, apparently. <laughs> Welcome back to Yahoo Finance, everyone. Brad Smith here with Brian Sazi at the Can Lion Festival of Creativity. We are here with Kevin Hart, actor, comedian, entrepreneur, and founder of Heartbeat, as well as the Heartbeat CEO, 
Ty Randolph. Great to have you both here with us today. Great introduction. <laughs> you guys are pro. <laughs> Great introduction. Well, first and foremost, we got to come correct for the Entertainer of the Year. Can Lions Amazing. 2023 Entertainer of the Year. What does that mean to you? Mind-blowing. Um, you know what, man? It's about time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling just to be recognized in any capacity. Um, it's not something that I allow to get to me too much, but to be able to come out here, um, have an opportunity to meet all of the amazing companies, brands that are here for the sole purpose of networking and growth upon relationships, to be able to come out here with my company and have a stance and, and opportunity to really just have a stance for others to have an understanding as to what we do, what we are. That's the bigger side of opportunity here. The Kevin Hart of it all, I love it. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by it. But the opportunity is more of a heartbeat opportunity, and that's what I'm, uh, I'm more excited about. Ty, how do you take Kevin's energy and a brand that really everybody loves and, and weave it into a business and take it to the next level? So uh, not alone. <laughs> we have a brilliant team of executives across creative, brand partnerships, our infrastructure, legal finance, you name it. It really takes a, a village or an army, if you will. Um, but, you know, a heartbeat, Kevin's the North Star and sort of the heartbeat of the company. Like, he sort of sets the tone, all of the energy that you see going into his work creatively from an entrepreneurial perspective. We really try to harness that, but not for the sake of building, you know, Kevin more. He always says to us, I'm not going to be any more famous than I already am. But really, it's about opportunity creation for the broader ecosystem of talent that's out there. We have amazing partnerships, and we're working with so many amazing creators across audio, TV, film. And, you know, I think what's really exciting about Heartbeat is it serves as a platform um, that he's created for the next generation of not just comedic creators, but just creators in general. Ty, when you think about the business landscape right now and the executive makeup, yeah. we're still a far away from seeing more women in leadership, mm. more women of color mm -hmm. in executive positions. Not at Heartbeat. <laughs> Not at Heartbeat. Not at Heartbeat. And, so, and so the fact that that has been prioritized yeah. and mm -hmm. that you've been entrusted with this role, but you also already had the skill set even before getting into this. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, let's make that, let's make that very clear Absolutely. that she's been entrusted with a role that was deserved. Uh, you know, opportunities are earned. They're not yeah. given just because. And just before Ty takes it and has a well-deserved moment to talk, um, you know, in regards to what you asked, I just want to highlight, like, the priorities of today for the entertainment business uh, were our priorities yesterday, yeah. right? Like, at the beginning stages, we wanted to be an example of the change that we wanted to see. So our infrastructure is one that's full of color, yeah. that's full of a variety of creatives um, and, and a landscape of inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Not because we're being told to do so or because there's a spotlight on it and other companies now have to alt and maneuver accordingly, but just because it's the right yeah. thing to do. So yeah. I just want to make sure that like the idea of what Ty Randolph is is so dope because she sits in the seat that's not only deserved but created by her hard work. Like you're talking about a woman who fast tracked her way to CEO and who's been underneath my infrastructure for years yeah. and started out yeah. in one position, was promoted so many different yeah. times to the point where I said, "Hey, man, I think it's best that you just run this." <laughs> uh, how did, how did you see this happening? Did you see yourself in this role ten years ago? Oh, definitely. So I always <laughs> I was going to be running something for someone or running something on my own. But you know what's interesting about this? What Kevin is saying is really important, I think, for this to land with, you know, your audience. And, you know, we say this with our peers and we try to constantly recommit ourselves to this mission. I joined as head of marketing for one of Kev one of the companies that we merged to form Harpy. I was promoted, was it five times in six years? Um, you know, from SVP of marketing to then take on monetization, EVP and GM, COO, and then CEO of two companies and then CEO of the one. And what was interesting about that is it was a complete meritocracy, right? It was if you earn it, then you get it. Absolutely. And so often there are folks who are earning it that don't get the opportunity. And when I got when, when I was appointed CEO, Kevin said one thing to me, let your story here be the rule and not the exception, right? And so my KPI as CEO is really opportunity creation. Everything I do from, you know, when we're talking about the bottom lines or we're talking about our creative output, um, the hiring of our team, it's all about how much value can we create 
create in this ecosystem mm -hmm. for our team members, right? The folks who work here, for our partners, the folks who we have commercial partnerships with, for our investors. Um, and we have to constantly, and that's something you earn every day, right? Whatever we did yesterday doesn't count. Um, but this idea of creating a meritocracy, because that's what we want in the marketplace, right? As long as we're driving subs and buzz or brand lift and recall, um, we want another opportunity to, to earn it. And so that's what I was given, and that's, you know, what I've committed to providing. Amen to that. She's done an amazing job. We're unbelievably lucky to have her, and I can say that the energy from the top truly does trickle down. And we have a hardworking unit, right? We have a hardworking unit that is aligned with the clear directive of scale, of IP, of ownership. And that opportunity, I love, it It, it not only has presented itself, but it's transformed into people understanding, like, the stars of tomorrow should come from underneath our umbrella. Yeah. That's a service that we want. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity for your writers, directors, yeah. actors, actresses? Like, what is the gateway? What's the new position that we can put people in to ultimately succeed and find their version of a star? If we do that correctly, then we're part of bigger conversations. And that's the priority. Kevin, I think a lot of executives, CEOs, and chairmen are going to watch this, and they're going to look at you and say, how do I drive that change from the top? Mm -hmm. I don't have an operational in the role in a company per se, mm -hmm. but I want to drive change throughout mm -hmm. my organization mm -hmm. like Kevin Hart has. Mm -hmm. What are the steps they can take? Uh, I think the first steps is be welcome to the opportunity of, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, what you don't know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And the best way to discover what you don't know is by listening, mm -hmm. by informing yourself and being open to the idea and concept yeah. of change. Yeah. And that change has to come with personnel. Mm -hmm. It has to come with ideating at a high level and acceptance to what that looks like. Um, I am not the smartest man in the world. I will never put myself in a position to claim to be that. But what I am is an amazing team player. Mm -hmm. And the team that I can say that I've been able to to put around me has helped me create this thing. It's a team engine. It's a team concept. And for all the change that we are a pure example of, it's come from the concept and idea and understanding of what people have brought to the table. It's not all Kevin. And if it was, then we would be in a bad position because I don't have that much time, energy, or or effort that I can put in a day-to-day. -day. I have to embed upon the world of opportunity that's brought to me from the people that I have at the table. They're there for a reason. Kevin and Ty, I want to end on a, a fun note here. We've come up with a little game of this or that. Five, five. Yahoo Finance Edition. Six, two. Wait. Ready. All right. Sorry. <laughs> this or that. Yahoo Finance Edition starts now. First question. All right. You have a partnership with Motor Trend, mm -hmm. so this was inspired by that. Bronco or Cybertruck? Oh man, you gotta go Bronco. Uh, when you talk about trucks in general, the foundation of a Bronco and the original foundation of a Bronco, you just don't get better. As you know, I'm a classic car guy, real car enthusiast. <laughs> That's why my answer was a little broken down. I Time apologize. Bronco as well? I guess. Bronco. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Second question here, better business person, Elon Musk or The Rock? Oh, that's Ooh. a good question. <laughs> Uh, you know what, man? You're talking about two entrepreneurs. There's no such thing as a better. Mm -hmm. Creators create. And you're looking at two people that love to create, and they've done it on very high levels. <laughs> so I beg to give an answer of either or. I embrace the world of what they uh, both How about this done. one? Any investing advice to The Rock? Uh, yeah. Do better. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Hart, Ty Randolph, thank you so much for thank you guys. your time joining us here at Yahoo Finance. Great thank conversation. Thank you, thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a fun interview over there. Thanks to Brad and Brian, the Robert Khan Alliance Festival in the south of France. Well, your subscriptions might be piling up between all the streamers, the clothing and food offerings that are out there right now. Well, get ready to spend even more money. Spotify planning to add a new premium tier. This is according to reports from Bloomberg Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal here with the details. Allie, I'm not ready to spend more money. What is this new offering <laughs> oh, well, going to include? Well, Sean, if you, want, if you want it. this new premium tier, it's <laughs> going to be more expensive. And this is what Bloomberg is reporting, that it's going to have enhanced 
audio capabilities, more expanded access to audio books. So we'll have to see what comes out if this is officially confirmed mm -hmm. by the company, what other perks we could potentially get. But this comes as investors have really pushed for more price hikes at Spotify across the board. We've seen that from competitors like Apple Music and YouTube Music uh, and Amazon Music as well. But Spotify has really steered clear of this. They said if and when they do price hikes, they're going to be very strategic in that. So this report suggesting that perhaps a new premium tier is the start to that. I did reach out to Spotify for comment. In a statement, they said they are constantly constantly looking for ways to improve their offerings and offer value to consumers, but that there's nothing new to report at this time. So we'll see if we get any official announcement there. But yeah, if you want this premium tier, you're going to be coughing up a little extra. Oh my goodness. Subscription <laughs> inflation now. Exactly. <laughs> Good exactly. Lord. All right. Speaking of some of the enhancements or changes that they're making, we saw news that Trevor Noah is going to be joining mm -hmm. their platform, but we know they also uh, cut some voices. So what does this mean with the addition of Trevor Noah? Yeah, so Trevor Noah, Spotify announced that he's going to have a new weekly podcast to launch later this year. And as we we're mentioning, it comes as they've cut ties with a lot of people, including Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's production company, Archwell Audio. Now, this is something that we've been seeing from Spotify. They've really been focusing on a new strategic realignment of their podcast division. We saw them uh, eliminate 200 jobs, about 2% of its workforce within the podcast unit. So clearly, they're trying to make some changes here to improve margins, improve profitability. That was a big story in 2022 with shares losing about 70% of their value for the year. So, you know, as the company has seen the podcast invest investments really hammer margins, this is something that they're looking to, mm -hmm. to be more strategic about, more strategic about their investments because they did spend upwards of $1 billion over the past four years. So we'll see if this story can play out. But analysts, especially recently, Recently, have been pretty optimistic moving I like forward. Trevor Noah, so I'll listen. Yeah, I think it would be a good podcast. Yeah, I think this I investment from Spotify makes, makes a sense. heck of a Agreed. lot. Of yes, and we'll that's take. that's the whole point. Yeah. They're trying to get the voices that make the most sense for their platform. Yeah, exactly. All right, Allie, thanks. Well, coming up, we are checking in on a few of the trending tickers moving after hours. Got those names for you when we come back. Hey guys, go, Brad, oh, Brad. Uh, anyway, I'm Brian Sazi here, Ken Lines for Yahoo Finance. Brad, that class was full about an hour ago. Nonetheless, we're here talking the biggest newsmaker in the game on the French Riviera. Will I am, Kevin Hart, you name it. Brad, I'm just blown away. We're just coming after the Fed meeting. All those billionaire yachts are out there, oh, yeah. and the vibe here is popping. Look, you didn't have to tell them about my glass. <laughs> Rihanna taught me, number one. Number two, the economic conversation here with the CMOs and C-suite that are trying to figure out where they're going to generate even more customer demand in a time of a spending downturn for discretionary items. But travel experiences like this, holding up. Cigars later? Sure, why not?
I'm Brian Sazi here on Yahoo Finance Live. Joining me now is the CEO of Brad Smith Inc. Brad Smith, Brad, good to see you here. Uh, Ken Lyons Film Festival, biggest thing you've learned? Biggest thing that I've learned for Brad Equity Partners to take back to New York City is that, number one, everybody is discussing how they can set their company up for the next leg of growth. We've spoken with Kevin Hart, Will I Am. We've spoken with McDonald's, with Delta. We've got these conversations that are going to blow your mind from here. The biggest thing I've learned is that everybody here, Brad, is just impeccably dressed like you, like me, like all the Yahoo Finance users out there on our platform. Brad, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for coming on today. That's it. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at some of these trending after hour stickers. We've got three names for you today, all in the red, FedEx, Visa, and Lazy Boy. Kicking it off with FedEx, we're looking at losses of nearly 3% in extended trading. It was all about the guidance here for the move that we are seeing in after hours here. 2024 profit guidance coming in below the street's expectations. Also with sales for its most recent quarter, that fell short of what Wall Street was looking for, 21.9 billion. Now the weakening demand kind of offsetting some of those cost-cutting initiatives that we have seen from CEO Raj Subramanian here over the last several months. Also a big announcement here from the company in terms of its executive management. CFO Mike Lenz is set to retire. An external search is underway for his replacement. We're looking at losses, like I just said, off nearly 3% over the last three months. We're still looking at gains of about 7%. We are well off the 52-week lows that we hit back in September after the company warned about guidance slowing growth here going forward. FedEx shares closing the day at 231 a share. Let's move it over to Visa. Another uh, executive shakeup here announced at the company. Also, their CFO naming Chris Sue as the new chief financial officer of Visa. Now, Chris Sue joining Visa from EA, where he also held the role of CFO. He also spent 25 years at Microsoft, you're looking at losses of just about two tenths of a percent in extended trading. I don't think it has a heck of a lot to do with that CFO announcement. Over the past year, shares are firmly in the green, up just about 19 percent. And rounding it out here with Lazy Boy, that stock off four and a half percent in extended trading. The guidance, revenue guidance for its fiscal Q1, missing the street's expectations. They see Q1 sales of 470 million to 490 million. Estimate on the street was for 522 million. So a bit short there in terms of what the street was looking for. And that's overshadowing the recent beats here for the company. Q4 did be here an adjusted EPS of 99 cents. Revenue, 561.3 million. Also retail sales up 4% for the quarter. Over the last year though, we're, we're still looking at gains. Lazy Boy up about 18%. All right, it is closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look back at some of the top stories of the day. New signs of strength in the housing sector. Housing starts surging in May jumping nearly 22 percent according to government data that is the fastest rate in over a year and building permits which are a sign of future construction also rising last month that data coming on the heels of a stronger reading on home builder sentiment yesterday due to low inventory especially of existing homes now sentiment has been rising for six straight months Plus, Bitcoin jumping today, topping $20,000. This coming as the crypto industry gets a vote of confidence from the financial sector giants. A new crypto exchange backed by Fidelity Digital Assets, Charles Schwab, and Citadel Securities now it's been live for a few weeks trading both Bitcoin and Ether. This coming after late last week, BlackRock announced that it filed an application for the first ever spot Bitcoin ETF. And Tesla Supercharger Network gets another customer, Rivian, announcing today it will access the Tesla network starting next year and will have an adapter available. This news follows deals that Tesla made with Ford and General Motors. Shares of both Rivian and Tesla jumping over 5% on the day. That'll do it for us today on Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern time for all your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Yahoo Finance, I will be at the KPMG's Women's Leadership Summit tomorrow. Don't miss a big interview. I will be sitting down with a dynamic duo, former Secretary of State Dr. Condoleezza Rice, also 18-time World Championship medalist, Allison Felix. I was speaking with the two of them as well as a number of other trailblazers within their own respective industries about what they are doing to advance women in the workplace. We got that for you tomorrow on Yahoo Finance. Have a great night.